All right, hello. My name is Ryan Dalglish. I am a pastor out in San Angelo, Texas. I've been traveling and preaching full-time since 1997 and have been pastoring a church since 2009 with some of my closest friends, Micah, Kenny, and Pierce. I have decided to start a YouTube channel. Uh, one, it will help us with a few church things down the line. We'll be able to post some stuff on here that will talk a little bit about the sermon we just had the previous Sunday and I'll be able to give you a heads up about the sermons that are coming up in the following weeks so that you can read along with us if you so choose to. But I also wanted to start it because I am a huge fan of the Bible. And one of the things that I have made it my goal to do for the last 20, 22 years is to help people love the Bible as well. I fell in love with the scripture. I grew up in church, but couldn't say really that I fell in love with the scripture. I heard enough from my pastors and youth pastors growing up that I should read the Bible that at 16, 17 years old, I began to try to do so. But every time I got burnt out, Leviticus kicked my butt every single time. It just, I couldn't get through it. And so even when I would skip it, I would find the Kings and the Chronicles to be too heavy for me at the time. But wouldn't you know, in 1995, I was a 19 year old college sophomore at Texas Tech University and had a Sunday school teacher get in my face and really challenge me again to read the scripture. But then I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And so I thought the very best thing that I could do was to, to shut him up. I just really wanted him off my case was to go and read my Bible. So yes, I actually made it through the Bible my first time because I wanted to prove a point to somebody. But February of 1995, 19 years old, and began studying the scripture. And about halfway through that first year, it really took hold of me and I haven't looked back. In fact, at the end of 1995, I read the autobiography of George Mueller, who was born in 1805 and died in 1898. He became a Christian when he was 20 years old at a university. And from the time he was 20 to the time he died at 93, in those Christian years, he is said to have read the, read the Bible over 200 times. And it just inspired me. I thought, man, I wanna, I wanna know the scripture that well. I wanna know God that well. And so that's what I have sought to do for the last 22 years since 1995. Well, here I am, and I am going to be using some of my time in these, these videos and the, on this YouTube channel. I'm gonna be using some of my time to help you understand some of the books of the Bible a little bit better so that as you're reading through them, you have a few resources that maybe I didn't have when I first started. I am not pretending to be a scholar. I am not pretending to have all the answers. There will certainly be some things in here that I get wrong, and I will do the best I can to correct those in time. A Couple of things about me. As I think I said, I don't know. I live in San Angelo, Texas. That's out in West Texas. Let's be honest, most of you who are watching this know me, so you already know where I live. I have a wonderful wife named Michelle. I have two wonderful boys who currently, this is, uh, are currently eight and six. And so I have two fantastic kids, really enjoy being their dad. And I also paint a lot. And so you're probably gonna see some of my art in these videos, it's because it is easier for me to film this at the gallery. It's consistently quiet here. I can close the door, close the blinds, lock the place up, and film this undisturbed for a few minutes. And that's a luxury that I can't get at home. So when I'm home with my boys, my time is their time as well. So I wanted to be able to have a few minutes uninterrupted to be able to talk to you. So here I am, I'm a pastor. I've been a traveling evangelist for over 20 years, slowly kind of doing that less. And now I guess I'm gonna start a YouTube channel. Uh, don't expect these videos to be professional. Don't expect them to be fancy. I am not a fancy person, all right? So I am sure that in time, some of my friends like Pierce will help me make these videos better. But for now, you're just gonna to have to get what you can get. So every time that I've ever read the Bible, I've begun in Genesis. I love Genesis and it could be that because I grew up in church, a lot of the stories are familiar to me but I really do enjoy the narrative of Genesis. So I wanna just put a few things in your head for you to think about if you happen to be reading Genesis, all right? One, you have in Genesis uh, one and two creation accounts. And a lot of people think, are there two different creation accounts there? Don't, don't read it like that. Don't think that it's two different creation accounts. Think of it uh, as one chapter giving depth and insight into the other chapter. And so what we really have in chapter two is a better unfolding, a little bit more detail into chapter one. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we think that each chapter has to necessarily in the timeline follow the chapter before it, but that's not always true. If I were to sit here and tell you about a vacation my wife and I took many years ago and then conclude the story and then go, oh, wait a minute, I remembered a detail I wanted to tell you. None of you would think that that detail I told at the end of my trip 
happened at the very end of my trip. So sometimes in the Bible, when you find a chapter and then the next chapter seems to not fit, it's because the author is going back and providing more insight. So that's what's happening in chapter one and chapter two. Be careful when you read chapter four. All growing up, I heard people say that Cain, his sacrifice wasn't liked because he didn't bring his best. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that Cain didn't bring his best. It does say that God was pleased with Abel's and that God was not pleased with Cain's. One of the things that's very important to remember is that there are no laws yet. The law hasn't been given. In fact, the law of Moses is about 2,500 years away. And because the law of Moses is 2,500 years away, there are no instructions on the kinds of sacrifices to bring. But one of the things that we see throughout the entirety of scripture, I'm thinking now Amos 5, I'm thinking Isaiah 1, I'm thinking Matthew, one of the things that we see throughout the rest of scripture is any sacrifice that was displeasing to God was displeasing because it wasn't brought with the right heart. So don't think of Cain's sacrifice as being displeasing to God because of what he brought. It's more likely how he brought it that made it displeasing to God. Now, I can't prove that. I'm just saying we can't say one way or the other why God was displeased with Cain's offering. All we can do is look at the rest of the scripture and know that any other place where God was displeased with an offering, it was because of the heart and not the content of the offering itself. So keep that in mind. One of the things that you uh, would like to think on and, and we should consider is, I always like to think of the timeline. I won't bore you with all the numbers right now, but remember that when Noah gets onto the ark in Genesis chapter seven, from the creation of Adam, from the forming of Adam to the flood in Genesis seven, 1,656 years have passed. Now, if you read a historian like Josephus, he's gonna put that number closer to 2,200 years. And I'm gonna be honest with you and tell you that 1,656 years may not be the right number. But if you add up all the numbers that are given in the genealogies of the Bible, what you're gonna find from Adam to the flood is 1,656 years have passed. And so that's how I arrive at that number. Another thing that we wanna take note of is in Genesis 7, it's gonna say that Noah took two of every type of unclean animal onto the ark. All growing up, all the vacation Bible schools that I went to as a kid, every Sunday school lesson that I ever heard on Noah's ark, talked about how he took two of every type of animal onto the ark. That's only partly true. The, the text actually says that he took two of every type of unclean animal onto the ark, and he took 14 of every type of clean animal and 14 of every type of bird onto the ark. Some of your translations won't say 14. Some of your translations will say sevens, meaning pairs of sevens. Some of your translations will flat out say pairs of sevens. And so 14 of every type of clean animal and bird. Now be really careful here. Some translators, some translators will go ahead and add in a parenthetical statement. Usually they do a good job of including it in parentheses or in italics, but a lot of people will say, Noah took these animals, these clean animals that were acceptable for food and sacrifice. These clean animals that were acceptable for food or sacrifice. One of the things that's important to remember is Noah didn't have a concept of clean and unclean animals. There is no law. In fact, from Genesis 7 until the law comes in Exodus, we still have about a thousand years before the law comes. We also know from Genesis chapter 9 that when Noah gets off the ark, God declares all meat to be clean, all animals to be clean. So why then does it say in Genesis 7, 14 of every type of clean animal and bird and two of every kind of unclean animal? Well, tradition tells us that Moses wrote this book and Moses a thousand years later would have been very aware of the law. So Moses is writing to an audience, Jews who have escaped Egypt. Moses is writing to an audience who understands the law, who has a concept of clean and unclean animals. And that's why Moses, when he wrote the account of Noah, put in clean and unclean animals. Certainly, Noah took two of some kinds of animals onto the ark. And certainly, Noah took 14 of other types of animals on the ark. But for Noah, for Noah, in his day, 1,000 years before the law, he could eat anything. There wasn't any such thing as an unclean animal. He could sacrifice things to God. There's no law yet. So keep that in mind. Keep in mind who's writing the book. Uh, Noah's not the one who wrote this story. So Noah, it's not Noah's perspective that there are clean and unclean animals. It's Moses' perspective on the story. That'll help a lot. The other thing to keep in mind about the flood, all growing up I had heard that Noah and his family were on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. Not true. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah and his family were on the ark for about 370 days. Here's how we know. In Genesis 7, it says that Noah and his family got on the ark the 17th day of the second month when Noah was 600. 17th day, second month, Noah is 600. And in chapter eight, it says they got off the ark on the 27th day in the second month when Noah was 601. 
So that's a year and 10 days later. Now, why do I say 370 days instead of 375? It's because as you look at the account in Genesis 8, they number their months with 30 days each. So 12 months times 30 days, 360 days, plus an additional 10 days is 370 days. So those are some neat things to think about when you think about the flood. Another really neat thing to think about is that Shem, one of the sons of Noah, who gets off the flood, actually outlives Noah by over 30 years. Sorry, <laughs> Shem actually outlives Abraham by 30 years. Now here's why that matters. Because Abraham is born at the very end of chapter 11 of Genesis, 292 years after the flood. 292 years after the flood, Abraham is born. Some people will add 60 years to that. I can talk about that in another uh, video, but we're not gonna bother you with that right now. If you strictly add up the numbers, 292 years after the flood, Abraham is born. And Abraham's gonna live for 175 years. Shem, the son of Noah, will outlive Abraham. That's really important because remember, all of the things of God and all the work that he's done have been passed down by oral traditions. So it really does matter that somebody who existed before the flood can live a long time after the flood so the oral traditions and the truth of God can continue. I want you to take special note, I want you to take special note of the last two verses of Genesis 10 and the first verse of Genesis 11. The last two verses of Genesis 10 are going to talk about all the tribes that got off the ark and spread out throughout the world. It's going to talk about the, all the tribes and all their languages. But Genesis 11, 1 is going to say, but the whole earth had one language. That's confusing for some people, but this is a very similar thing to Genesis 1 and 2. We're getting more detail. You see, when all the people came off the ark, there was only one language. It was Noah and his family. And after many, many generations, Genesis chapter 10 does for us, gives us the genealogy of Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of, of Noah, and it takes it all the way out. And so it gives us all these generations. Well, by the end of chapter 10, by the end of all the generations, there are a multitude of languages. But then chapter 11 rewinds for us, and it tells us how we came to have all of those nations and all of those languages. So Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel is rewinding. It's taking us further back into chapter 10. It's actually taking us, I think, back into 1025. Don't hold me to that because I forgot to check it before I started the video, but talking about when the earth was divided. Genesis 1025, I believe, talks about the days when the earth was divided. And so Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel is gonna to talk to us about that. Now in Genesis 12, uh, Abraham is 75 years old, and we know that he's gonna have the son of promise, Isaac in chapter 21, when he is 100 years old. So Abraham is 100 years old when his son Isaac is born. Here's why that matters. Because in Genesis 25, verses seven and eight, we see the death of Abraham recorded for us. Abraham's death is recorded in Genesis chapter 25, verses seven and eight, and he is recorded of, at, at having died at 175 years old. 175 years old minus 100 makes his son Isaac 75. Now here's what's interesting about that. It records the death of Abraham. But then the next story it tells us about Isaac is that he was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And then it talks about him being 60 years old when his sons were born. Here's why that matters. If you're not careful, you're gonna think that Abraham died and then Isaac, sorry, yeah, Isaac got married and then Isaac had his sons. That's not what's happening here. The author for us, traditionally thought of as Moses, the author here for us is wrapping up the story of Abraham. Okay, I'm done with telling you all the important things about Abraham. He died when he was 175. Let's move on to the life of Isaac. And when it moves on to the life of Isaac, it's actually going to rewind a little bit. And so it tells us that Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah. That would make Abraham 140. It tells us that Isaac was 60 when his twin sons, Jacob and Esau, were born. That makes Abraham 160. And so then, since we know that Abraham died at 175 years old, Abraham did get to see his grandkids for at least 15 years. Don't let the timeline confuse you. In fact, at some point, just make a little note of the dates, make a little note of the ages, and it'll really help you begin to see the clarity of that. Now, uh, we're gonna fast forward all the way to the end of 25. I told you that the twins, Jacob and Esau, are born. Jacob is also going to be the guy we know as Israel. Israel has 12 sons. One of those sons is a man named Joseph. Joseph is 17 years old in chapter 37, and Joseph's 10 older brothers don't like him, and so they sell him into slavery, and he goes into Egypt. Now, this was by God's plan. It was by God's plan because God sent Joseph into Egypt to protect the nation of Israel, to protect the people of Israel. At 30 years old, Joseph is going to enter into the work of Pharaoh the king, 
there's going to be seven years of plenty where Joseph is going to help the, the Pharaoh put all this food aside, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. It will be in the second year of famine. Now remember, Joseph entered into the service of Pharaoh at 30 years old, and then there were seven years of plenty. That would make him 37 years old, and then there are two years of famine. It was seven total, but our story picks back up after two years. So Joseph at this point is about 39. And Joseph's brothers are starving in Canaan, and they come to Egypt for food. By this point, Joseph is completely immersed in the Egyptian culture. He's wearing their clothes, he's speaking their language, and he addresses his brothers through an interpreter. His brothers haven't laid eyes on him for 22 years. There's also an argument for a longer period of time that once Joseph entered the, the service of Pharaoh, there was a gap before the seven years of plenty have happened, and that's possible. But one of the things to remember here is that it's been at least 22 years since Joseph's brothers have seen him, and now he looks very Egyptian. Long story short, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. The whole family moves to Egypt. They come there for five years. There's five more years of famine. And uh, his father, Jacob, who is known as Israel, comes. And we see in chapter 47, we see in chapter 47 that Israel is 130 years old, 130 years old when he comes to Egypt. And we see in chapter 47, verse 28, he dies 17 years later. So Joseph has been in Egypt for a long time. He is sent there by God to preserve his family, to protect his brothers, to protect these people that he doesn't see for at least 22 years. And then Joseph uh, brings his father over, Israel comes, he lives there for 17 years before he dies. Uh, so when you're thinking of Genesis, when you're thinking of all these things, it will help to try to put them together in your mind. It will help to try to ask yourself some questions and begin to think about who is the son of this guy? Who's the father of this guy? Start thinking about how old people lived. That might not be very exciting to you, but I promise you it will help you understand the Bible better. So as you're reading the scripture, basics, basics. Why was God displeased with Cain's offering? The Bible doesn't say, but why is God displeased with anybody else's offering in the scripture? Well, because they didn't bring it with the right heart, okay? Why, uh, why is it that we were taught that Noah only took two of every type of animal onto the ark and not the 14? And why is it the 14 of the clean animals? And who says that? Is it Noah who's saying that? Or is it Moses who's saying that about Noah? It's really important to remember that the law doesn't exist yet. And focus on those things. Focus on the details. The details will make the story. The example that I always give is I'm currently 42. And if I were to tell you that several years ago, my father took me hunting and left me in a deer blind until two in the morning and I was cold and I was scared and you later, and I kind of drag the whole story out and embellish it, and then, and then later you come to me and you say, well, how old were you when your dad did that to you? And I said, oh, I was about 38. You'd laugh at me, you'd scoff. But if I had told you in this story, well, I was just seven or six or five, then you'd go, oh, okay, I understand the fear. The, the details matter, the timeline matters, so we're trying to fit it all together, okay? Remember that Shem, who gets off the ark, outlives Abraham. The, the oral tradition, the life, the story of God matters. And, and so there are a whole bunch of little details. Um, one of my favorite details from the genealogy leading up to Noah. So Genesis chapter five tells us that Enoch had a son and Enoch named his son Methuselah, Methuselah. Methuselah is gonna be the oldest recorded man in the Bible, 969 years old. But Methuselah's name has two possible meanings. The, the more common meaning is swift flies the spear which doesn't really speak to us about the situation. But the other meaning of Methuselah's name means he dies, it comes. He dies, it comes, or he dies, it happens. So I want you to consider for a moment, if you add up the numbers in Genesis 5, Methuselah actually dies in the year that the flood comes. Methuselah dies in the year that the flood comes. And of course, we know that Enoch is one of two men in the Bible who didn't die. Enoch was a man who was faithful. He was a prophet. He walked with God. And Enoch names his son Methuselah. And, and then Methuselah lives until the days of the flood. So details, it's the details that will bring the scripture into clarity for you. And I really hope that uh, these videos will help and that we can talk more about it. I will later give you the timeline of Genesis and hope that that will be beneficial to you as well. Anyway, thanks for watching and I hope that you have a great day. Bye-bye.